You've heard about the disastrous tale of the Avro Manchester, the cursed, mechanically inept predecessor of the much more successful Avro Lancaster. But have you heard about the disastrous tale of the other Avro Manchester? Equally as disappointing, but much more obscure. Now, apparently, naming an aircraft after the city of Manchester came with some sort of curse, at least as far as Avro was concerned. The Avro 533, which was given the title of Manchester, was the development of two earlier designs, the Avro 523 Pike and the Avro 529, which also were not exactly good. The Pike, which, as an aside, was the first Avro design to feature twin engines, and was also the first to receive a name, was designed as a multi-purpose aircraft for the British Admiralty during the First World War. It was designed to fulfil several roles, including reconnaissance, nighttime bombing, and most importantly, it could serve as a Zeppelin hunter a role in which various parties had been exploring with great enthusiasm, albeit with mixed results, ever since the first Zeppelin raids that happened back in January of 1915. The Pike was a moderately sized three-bay biplane with equal span wings. Its wingspan was 60 feet, or 8.2 meters. It had a loaded weight of 6,064 pounds, or 2,750 kilos, and it could carry a pair of 112 pound high explosive bombs within a small internal bomb bay. It was initially powered by the Sunbeam Nubian, a 7.6 litre water cooled V8, which provided approximately 160 horsepower and drove a two blade wooden propeller in the pusher configuration. It had a crew of three a pilot, a nose gunner who also assisted with navigation, and a rear gunner, both of whom operated Lewis guns. The Pike was ready for flight by late spring of 1916, and it made its maiden flight on May the 19th. On paper, the design looked promising, but during the first flight demonstration off the Isle of Grain, with several Royal Navy officers present, an embarrassing situation occurred. The Pike got airborne easily enough, in the hands of the capable test pilot F.P. Raynham, but once airborne he found it increasingly difficult to control. After some experimental manoeuvres, he figured out that the centre of gravity was located far too much towards the rear, and the Pike was so tail heavy that he dared not throttle back to attempt a landing lest he stall out and crash. Disaster was only avoided because the Pike's rear seat was currently being occupied by one R.H. Dobson, who was acting as the flight's observer. To bring the centre of gravity forward, Dobson had to climb out of his cockpit, crawl along the top of the fuselage of an aircraft currently in flight, climbed over his test pilot, and eventually dropped himself into the nose gunner station. This shifted the centre of gravity forward just enough for Raynham to land the Pike safely. Following this incident, Avro tried to reassure the Navy that the problem with the centre of gravity could be easily fixed. Unfortunately for them, the development of the Pike had taken longer than expected, and instead of waiting on any hypothetical improvements, the Navy placed an order for a competing design that was being developed by the Short Brothers. During this time, a second Pike had also been built and was also being evaluated, known as the Avro 523A. The main differences were the use of 150 horsepower green engines in place of the Nubians, and the switch to a tractor configuration instead of being a pusher. Following the rejection of the Pike by the Navy, both of these machines were returned to Avro and were used as experimental test beds for a number of years. This did not, however, mark the end of the story for Avro's first twin-engine design. While the first Pike was still being constructed, the Admiralty ordered two enlarged versions of the type as the Avro 529. Envisioned as a long-range bombing aircraft, principally to raid German naval bases and Zeppelin hangars, the first 529 made its maiden flight in April of 1917. 
powered by 190 horsepower Rolls-Royce Falcons, this aircraft was considered a pure testing machine as it carried no military equipment whatsoever. This was because the Admiralty had insisted on the 529 having folding wings for easier storage and transportation, but this necessitated having a large reduction in the size of the tailplane and elevators, hence the need for a testing aircraft first. It was soon found that while it had improved directional stability over the old Avro Pike, the 529 had appalling longitudinal control, owing to the aforementioned shrunken control surfaces. An attempt was made to rectify this with the Avro 529A, which was completed with full military equipment and a provision for a bomb load of 20 50 pound high explosive bombs. But with the arrival of such designs as the Hanley Page Type O, the Avro 529 became obsolete overnight. If further improvements in the design could have been found, they were never explored, as aside from a few early test flights, in which the 529A's performance was rated as mediocre at best, it saw little use and was scrapped within about 18 months. With the failure of the Avro 523 and the 529 to secure any production order, it would have made sense for Avro to abandon the concept and move on to something new. But they did not. Either due to sunk cost fallacy or good old fashioned stubbornness, they had another crack at the design with the Avro 533, which was then named the Manchester. Though based on the lines of the 523 and the 529, the Manchester featured several improvements. It had a deeper and more aerodynamically shaped fuselage, which allowed for better crew accommodation, more equipment and a larger bomb bay. It had a new rudder designed by de Havilland. It had new park bench balanced ailerons to correct the stability problems of the earlier designs. And, most importantly, it was to have a new and more powerful engine, which we will discuss in a moment. This would allow the bomb load to creep up to 1,000 pounds, or 453 kilos, and a top speed in excess of 125 miles per hour, or 201 kilometers per hour. Now, this didn't put it in the same category as the Handley Page Type O, which could carry twice the bomb load, but it did promise to be faster and to have better handling. The Manchester was described as being able to perform the duties of bombing, photo reconnaissance and medium range maritime patrol. Basically, it was an early example of what you could call a medium bomber, as it thoroughly outclassed any single engine designs, but was itself less powerful than the heavier machines like the Hanley Page Type O. On paper, Avro's persistence appears to have paid off, as the design did indeed look very promising, and there was interest from both the British Army and the Royal Navy. But most unhappily, and in words that would be repeated with the other Avro Manchester of the late 1930s, this aircraft was completely let down by its engine. The 533 Manchester was meant to be powered by the ABC Dragonfly, a 9-cylinder radial engine that weighed just 600 pounds, but was capable of producing over 340 horsepower. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because I've mentioned this engine in a few other videos, because the Dragonfly was notoriously disappointing. Designed by Granville Bradshaw in 1917, it was ordered in huge numbers by the start of 1918, with various British firms ordering more than 10,000 examples. But not long after the first engines arrived, it appeared that the Dragonfly was a dud. They were overweight, underpowered, overheated easily, and vibrated so violently during test flights that they sometimes broke their mounting bolts. Three prototypes of the Manchesters had been ordered in the spring of 1918, however by the time the first aircraft was nearing completion, the delivery of the Dragonfly engine was suspended, owing to the aforementioned issues, and because of this, Avro was forced to substitute it with the 300 horsepower Sidley Puma, which was a six-cylinder inline engine. Now redesignated as the Manchester Mark II, the first prototype made its maiden flight in December of 1918. 
The less powerful engines meant that the bomb load had to be revised from 1,000 pounds to 880, but in early flight tests, the Manchester did demonstrate excellent performance and outstanding manoeuvrability for a twin-engine aircraft. On more than one occasion during demonstrations, the Manchester Mark II was put through various roles, and it was even looped. The second prototype was delivered in May of 1919, this time delivered as a Mark I and powered by the planned Dragonfly. Its performance was even better than the Mark II, but the Dragonfly engines continued to cause trouble, and once again things were delayed. Eventually, it was somewhat tamed into the Dragonfly Mark 1A, and these were installed in the third Manchester prototype, which first flew in October of 1919. Once again, the Manchester performed well, but once again its excellent outing was marred by the spectacular failure of a Dragonfly engine mid-flight. This pretty much spelled the end of things, as the engine would be grounded from further use in 1920, and additionally, following the end of the war back in 1918, the British Air Ministry had neither the funds nor the inclination to order any new bombing aircraft, especially one with such a troubled development history, and the three Everett Manchester prototypes would eventually be scrapped in the early 1920s. As the type was never ordered into production, Avro decided to reuse the name Manchester 19 years later, when its new heavy bomber took to the skies for the first time. However, history was fated to repeat itself, as the new Manchester was just as troubled as the old one. But that is not a story for another day, as I've already done a video on the new Manchester, so if you haven't watched it yet, I recommend you go and check it out, because oh boy, did that thing have some problems. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the Patreon supporters. Moving forward, the number of videos being released on the channel will hopefully increase again, as all the major things going on behind the scenes have finally settled down, and I'm going to be building up a backlog, which will hopefully mean no more lulls in content for the foreseeable future. A big thank you of course to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier supporters, and a warm welcome to Zentowert and Delta7B, I think I got the name of the former correct, who are the newest members of this special group. Now when it comes to the patron list, I might be forced to not update it every video and update it every second or third video, as I want to have a backlog of videos uploaded to YouTube and Patreon in advance. But I'm still figuring all of that out, so stay tuned for more changes on that later on. As always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.